Thank you, Paul, for that kind introduction. So last fall, I had the uh, privilege of uh, being invited to make a few uh, short remarks at the final uh, gathering of the uh, Institute for the Study of American Evangelicals, the ISAE. Uh, I suspect that uh, some of you were there for that memorable, if uh, also a bit bitter, uh, um, bittersweet moment. Uh, and I, I will confess that part of what I'm going to do uh, this evening is to expand uh, greatly on those remarks. Uh, Along the way, I was placing some autobiographical sides uh, about my experiences uh, researching and writing uh, the history of modern American evangelicalism. Uh, most of my talk, uh, though, will offer a commentary on is okay. Okay, good. Uh, most of my talk will offer a commentary on the state of American evangelical historiography. Uh, that is, the, the uh, historical writing about American evangelicalism, uh, specifically the study of evangelicalism since 1945, which is my area of uh, focus. Uh, I, I hope that this approach does not stray too far uh, from uh, the orthodoxy of this lecture series. Uh, I'm, it might push the limits a bit of what I'm expected to talk about, um, but as a kind of preemptive act of uh, self-defense, I, I will say two things. Uh, First, uh, the archival materials that are housed uh, in this building uh, were my primary source entree into the serious study of American evangelical history. I'm definitely grateful uh, for that. Uh, my memory tells me that I was, uh, and we were actually talking about this over supper, uh, uh, my memory uh, tells me that I was first in touch with uh, Wayne Weber, uh, though it might have been Paul or it might have been Bob uh, Schuster uh, uh, as well, back in the fall of 2001. Uh, when I first started researching Billy Graham, and I, was, I, uh, I, I requested a photocopy of a uh, Billy Graham Evangelistic Association brochure about race relations, which I think is, uh, I think there's a copy of that back there. Um, I, I think I had those details right. Uh, unfortunately, my personal archive does not approach the quality of what you will find in this uh, building. Uh, second, uh, by my count, every major historian of evangelicalism that I will talk about tonight uh, utilize the Graham Center archives uh, in some capacity. Uh, and very likely all of them have visited the archives at one time or another, and that kind of speaks for itself, I think. When I used uh, the word confessional uh, a second ago, uh, by the way, I was not using it uh, in the uh, uh, Calvin College sense of confessional. Um, uh, rather, uh, actually, I realize I cut that line earlier, but I, uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to say, Strike a, a, a bit of a confessional tone tonight, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not using that in the Calvin College sense of confessional, but rather uh, in its more colloquial uh, therapeutic sense, uh, also its criminal law sense, uh, uh, meaning roughly an admission. Uh, so my confession, my admission is that I am a somewhat ambivalent, uh, and partly for that reason a rather marginal member of the community of those who study American evangelicalism. Uh, my ambivalence partly is rooted in uh, professional status, or lack thereof, uh, but more relevant for this talk, my ambivalence is rooted in the very nature of evangelical studies itself, uh, or at least in the nature of uh, what the historical study of evangelicalism has come to be. Uh, it is hardly news that the historiography of evangelicalism has been a very personal thing uh, for the vast majority of the scholars who have written it. Modern uh, evangelical historiography was an outgrowth of, not a reaction against, what I have elsewhere called the uh, neo-evangelical project, uh, and I'm referring there to the uh, uh, by neo-evangelical project, the effort that was epitomized by Billy Graham, uh, also by uh, theologian Carl Henry and others, uh, to raise the uh, public profile and influence of born-again Protestantism, uh, and in doing so, to restore evangelicalism to its previous custodial position in American public life. Uh, that analysis is also influenced by uh, uh, some of the work of Grant Wacker uh, as well, whom I'll mention a bit later. And with that uh, neo-evangelical project came a, a profound impulse uh, and a burden uh, to represent. Uh, put another way, uh, much of evangelical historiography has been a continuation of evangelical history itself. Uh, it is likewise hardly news that this dynamic, this synergy between studying evangelicalism and representing it, uh, has its upsides. Uh, uh, namely works of deep integrity and empathy, uh, and also its downsides. Uh, from the outside perspective, a certain cliquishness uh, that, to be sure, also exists in many other scholarly communities, so it's not unique to the study of evangelicalism. 
What would be news is if evangelical historiography was to grow farther apart from evangelical history, that is, farther apart from the story of American evangelicalism or from being part of that story. And actually, I would argue that it is doing so and, and it will continue to do so, as I will outline below. Uh, at that ISAE gathering uh, last year, I made uh, the following prediction. Uh, I'm quoting myself here. Uh, in coming years, uh, fewer and fewer historians of evangelicalism will have a childhood or an existing connection to evangelical faith. Uh, such a uh, development, uh, I would suggest, would be the culmination of what my lecture title refers to as the born-again moment uh, in American evangelical historiography. So here is the major argument that I want to, uh, us to consider or to chew on uh, this evening. Uh, evangelical historiography is being born again as something other than evangelical. Uh, before going any farther, I wanted to clarify uh, kind of the analytical framework that I'm using here. Um, uh, back at the, at the uh, ISAE, ISAE gathering, I noted that, that its closing, uh, however premature it seemed uh, to some of us there, uh, could in some ways be seen as the conclusion of a mini moment in American history. Uh, and in my recent book, uh, I identified, identified that moment as an age of evangelicalism. Uh, which I argue lasted from the, the 1970s until uh, just about now. Uh, any title or argument that features the word age of uh, is by nature an embellishment, uh, although my intention was not to use the word age in a kind of paradigmatically exclusive way. So an age of, uh, you might say. Uh, during uh, the age of evangelicalism, I argue, uh, evangelicalism provided alternately a language, a medium, and a foil by which millions of Americans came to terms with political and cultural changes, uh, whether they were evangelical Christians or not, however you define evangelical. So we had the Jesus Movement, the, uh, books like The Total Woman from the 1970s, uh, Jimmy Carter, A Moral Majority, People for the American Way, The uh, Satanic Panic of the 80s, and so on and on. Uh, and we also had, uh, not least I would argue, institutions like the ISAE. Uh, so that there was kind of an accompanying age of evangelical scholarship, you might say. Uh, and, and this is, uh, that age of evangelical scholarship is the starting point for my story of how we got to the point where the study of evangelicalism is becoming separated from evangelical history itself. The age of evangelical scholarship that I, I will be considering uh, was itself the culmination of uh, two kind of separate trends that gradually con um, converged. Uh, the first trend was uh, the intellectual um, awakening and maturation of a group of prominent evangelical scholars uh, between the 1970s and 1990s. Uh, second, uh, there were a number of larger uh, social forces that kind of made evangelicalism an it phenomenon of sorts, or that led to it receiving an outsized amount of attention. Uh, the first trend, uh, combined with the second one, uh, shaped uh, uh, two subsequent groups of historians that, that I'll, I'll be considering. Uh, first, there was a new generation of uh, evangelically rooted, if not always affiliated, uh, scholars who pursued topics that found a large existing audience. Uh, and then finally, and more recently, there is now a collection of scholars who really lack any uh, sociological attachment to evangelicalism, uh, but who see in evangelical history uh, a topic that is compelling and that might, you know, get them a job to boot. Uh, so uh, these uh, three groups of historians are the uh, case studies that I'm going to analyze below. And just to make sure I'm being clear here, I'll, I'll, I'll restate those uh, three groups I'm considering. Uh, first, uh, a cohort of uh, true blue evangelical scholars who made the rest of the historical field uh, pay attention to what uh, they were studying. Uh, second, and in my book, uh, uh, or, or here, actually, tonight, and in my book, I call them the thoughtful evangelicals. Uh, second, uh, I'll be considering uh, some of their students, uh, along with some fellow travelers, uh, who, who were um, much more likely to assimilate into the secular academy. Uh, and I call them the uh, liminals, uh, because they've straddled the line or the threshold between uh, evangelical academic culture and the uh, secular academy. And then third, uh, I'm looking at a newer group of scholars who were not really uh, under the evangelical canopy, uh, 
uh, but who ran with the subject matter and confirmed uh, the status of evangelicalism as a viable scholarly subject, and I called them the trendsetters. Uh, so these three groups emerged in different times and places, but they have come to coexist uh, and they continue to do so. Uh, however, that last group, the trendsetters, is really now where the action is in terms of uh, the study of evangelical history, I would argue. Uh, so effectively, uh, I would argue, we are witnessing the uh, secularization of evangelical historiography. Uh, or put less dramatically, uh, the fact that evangelical history is no longer insider's history. So what I'm going to do uh, for the rest of this talk is sketch out the above three groups. Uh, my insights are inescapably anecdotal uh, and unabashedly opinionated, uh, but hopefully uh, they point to my larger argument, again, that the evangelical moment in American historiography uh, means that the story of evangelicalism uh, in many ways is no longer in the hands of evangelicals. So first, uh, the group I call the thoughtful evangelicals. Um, so if, uh, as I argue in my uh, second book, uh, evangelicalism was everywhere uh, during the last 40 or so years, uh, then the historical scholarship on evangelicalism now seems to be everywhere too. Uh, it is now easy to connect evangelicalism with many of the great <coughs> shifts in mid 20th century and late 20th century American history. Uh, the rise of the Sun Belt region, uh, the growth of the, the Walmart service sector economy, uh, the proliferation of non-governmental organizations, uh, and the eventual rightward turn in American political culture. Uh, the origins of these revelations lie uh, in the works of historians uh, who no doubt are familiar uh, um, uh, uh, to most of you, uh, people like uh, George Marsden, uh, Mark Knoll, uh, Grant Wacker, and others, including Edith. Uh, including their students and mentees. Uh, those historians, uh, whom again I refer to in my book as the thoughtful evangelicals, uh, influenced me, uh, turning to uh, the autobiographical side of my talk, uh, really before I even knew who, who they were. Uh, I wrote my first uh, scholarly essay about evangelicalism during my first semester of graduate school at Vanderbilt uh, some 14 years ago. Uh, the uh, topic was Billy Graham and Civil Rights in the Modern South. Uh, the essay, uh, with its uh, straightforward title, Billy Graham and the Changing Post-War South, uh, became my master's thesis, uh, which begat a larger dissertation on Billy Graham in the South, which led to a book, uh, which was purportedly still about Graham in the South, but has just as accurately been described by others as a political biography of Billy Graham. Somewhere along the line, I became a historian of American evangelicalism. Uh, I, I had initially supposed that I was merely a historian of the American South with a related focus on political culture. Uh, for better or worse though, other people started, started thinking of me as someone who did uh, evangelicalism. Uh, looking back now, I probably had been a historian of evangelicalism all along, or at least for quite some time. Uh, more than I realized, my intellectual development had been shaped by encounters with the thoughtful evangelicals. Uh, sometime in the early 1990s, uh, when I was maybe 15 or thereabouts, um, I attended the Green Valley Book Fair uh, near my hometown in, in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia. Uh, there, at that book fair, I happened upon a book titled The Search for Christian America, uh, which was authored, as many of you might know, uh, by uh, Mark Knoll, George Marsden, and Nathan Hatch. Um, I'm not sure what exactly made me, made me pick up that book. Uh, my guess looking back, uh, th these things are always clearer in hindsight, uh, is that I was frustrated uh, with um, the pastor of my home church, uh, uh, which was part of the Mennonite church. Uh, my pastor, uh, who uh, called himself a Mennonite, uh, had placed copies of the newspaper or the newsletter of the Christian Coalition uh, uh, in my, on my church's literature table, which I thought didn't really comport with uh, Mennonite theology, or my 15-year-old interpretation of it at least. Uh, so something about the search for Christian America made me think that I could use it to push back against those whom they imagined had, wh whom, uh, who imagined that they had found uh, uh, that Christian America and could speak for it. Uh, so far as I can recall, uh, I knew nothing about the evangelical roots of the authors. Uh, and at the time, I really could not, would not have known uh, Crossway Books or Erdman's, uh, for that matter, from Random House. Um, in fact, had I known about the book's evangelical ties, I might not have picked it up at all. Uh, to be candid, uh, uh, I came of age um, viewing evangelicalism, uh, that word, as a kind of uh, negative force uh, of assimilation, 
um, for Mennonites, uh, sapping the tradition of its identity uh, and, and its prophetic uh, content. Um, as I did some research later, I realized that this was not at all unlike how some, some Southern Baptists uh, uh, felt in the 1970s as uh, the Southern Baptist Convention started striking a more fundamentalist um, uh, tone. Uh, and in both cases, that line of criticism about evangelicalism came largely from progressive circles. So there's, some, there's a bit of irony there. Um, uh, but if you've been following uh, the situation with uh, the CCCU, the Consortium of Christian Colleges and Universities, and the fact that two uh, Mennonite schools, um, uh, including my alma mater, Gershon College, uh, withdrew from it, um, uh, I think that, that those tensions kind of help, help explain a bit of what's going on there. My critical uh, perspective, of course, reflected the extent to which I actually op already operated in an evangelical milieu, and, and that is I knew something about it. Um, I grew up going to Billy Graham films uh, and, and watching videos of Josh McDowell uh, sermons. Uh, so yes, I was definitely in touch with, with what some would call the uh, evangelical subculture. In fact, I think I was evidence of just how mainstream in some ways that culture really was. Uh, so more than I was willing to admit, uh, I came to my graduate studies uh, indebted to uh, uh, evangelical scholars. Uh, it was easy to, to take for granted what they had accomplished. Uh, in an era of renewed attention to evangelicalism, they showed us what evangelicalism, what evangelicalism explained about uh, American culture. Uh, for example, American culture was deeply modern, yet also deeply resistant to certain forms of modernization. Uh, as we learned from George Marsden. Uh, also, the relative prominence of evangelical modes in American society was a product of the populist free market context that disestablishment, separation of church and state, had created, uh, as we learned from Nathan Hatch. Uh, throw in the works of Mark Knoll, Grant Wacker, and others, uh, and we have a body of work that, I, that as I've written elsewhere, to quote myself again, um, saw evangelical uh, Christianity as central to the course of American society and culture uh, if hardly vital to the vision of the Founding Fathers themselves. Uh, scholarship is rarely enduring if it lacks a straightforward upshot, you know, kind of lesson. Uh, and for the collective scholarship of the thoughtful evangelicals, that upshot uh, was the uh, directive to take religious ideas and beliefs seriously as factors in American historical change, um, alongside all the other social, economic, and environmental things, elements that historians usually discern or, or factor in. So how did these scholars become giants uh, in their field? Uh, through incredible work, uh, to be sure, but let's be realistic. Uh, you uh, really cannot write yourself off the island. Uh, someone has to send a rescue boat or at least shine some light on you. Uh, so there were internal dynamics that produced the great works in question, but definitely outside factors contributed greatly to their recognition. Uh, so things happened uh, that produced a broaderly schol broader scholarly interest in evangelicalism and fundamentalism. Uh, this scholarly interest had its roots uh, in the post-World War II revival, uh, but was more, in more intimately or more directly, I would argue, the outgrowth of what I call the 70s evangelical moment. Uh, most importantly, uh, the emergence of the Christian right uh, toward the close of that decade. So in other words, Jerry Falwell, uh, was more of an immediate impetus than, than Billy Graham. Uh, and all of the above put evangelicalism on the map in popular culture, but also in intellectual life. What is interesting to me uh, is just how invested in evangelical history uh, this generation of scholars has remained, in spite of their, uh, in some cases, their personal ambivalence, I have to use that word again, uh, about the label evangelical and the baggage that sometimes can accompany it. Uh, to some extent, uh, they might not have a choice uh, because it was the cultural power of this thing called evangelicalism itself that made their work so relevant. Um, I could cite many examples here, uh, but I want to comment uh, briefly on two uh, seemingly quite different expressions of this relevance. Uh, uh, George Marsden, the historian George Marsden, uh, and the historian Randall Balmer. Uh, and to be clear, I'm talking here mostly about, less about their works than about their scholarly personas, their images, basically. Uh, mirror images of each other, in some ways, uh, Marsden and Balmer both write in the confessional mode, to use that word again, uh, but for different reasons and toward different ends. Uh, first, uh, George Marsden. Uh, 
as Mark Knoll, uh, uh, whom I imagine most of you know of, uh, who, who, who was a is a historian of, of, a, of comparable, accompli comparable accomplishments, uh, recently mo wrote about Marsden. Uh, Marsden's classic 1980 study, uh, Fundamentalism in Modern Culture, quote, cracked open the door to the cascade of serious scholarship on and by evangelicals that has poured forth from, from university presses ever since. Uh, so Marsden is influential enough that a recent review essay refers to, quote, the post-Marsden era of evangelical history. So people were saying that something is post you. You know, it's a compliment. It's a compliment. Um, you're, you're influential. Uh, Marsden uh, is renowned uh, both for his vision of Christian scholarship and his contention that such scholarship should have a demarcated place within a genuinely pluralistic American academy. Uh, Marsden begins his latest book, which, which is a very insightful uh, analysis of uh, 1950s American thought, by noting his failure to abide by the scholarly mores of, uh, that, of, of the post-World War II era, which prized, quote, neutral observers uh, speaking on the basis of universal reason. Uh, Marsden avowedly writes as, quote, uh, an Augustinian Christian, which to me translates as basically reformed evangelical. Uh, his point of view acknowledges, quote, that people differ in their fundamental loves and first principles, but that, quote, all humans as fellow creatures of God can communicate through common standards of rational discourse. There's a bit of awkwardness, uh, I think, uh, in this declaration of perspective. Uh, one could suggest that such a universalist notion of God-given rational discourse doesn't really need to be announced at all, uh, if God is truly in control, that is. Uh, and that in announcing it, one is actually differ differentiating oneself uh, from most other creatures of God. Uh, secular scholars uh, well, often, uh, uh, often were quite puzzled, uh, I think, by Marsden's need to confess, but they definitely took note of his argument about the role of faith in the postmodern university. Uh, and some wondered, uh, some of the more critical voices wondered if he was really making a kind of backdoor case for the, uh, for the reassertion of Christian privilege. Uh, Randall Balmer uh, has largely escaped uh, this kind of skepticism, this, this, uh, this kind of skepticism from uh, the uh, secular academy, uh, even though many of his works are no less confessional. Uh, Balmer writes about evangelicalism, quote, as a jilted lover. Uh, and his works uh, over the past 20 plus years have evaluated modern evangelicalism against two historical standards. Uh, the first standard would be 19th century uh, evangelical reform, of which of course Wheaton was a great part. Uh, and the second standard would be the uh, pre-Christian right evangelical subculture of his childhood. Uh, and, and in his mind, m recent evangelicalism fails uh, 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 to measure up to other. So why has Balmer had an easier time of it than Marsden, outside of evangelical circles, that is? Uh, for starters, to be candid, his politics. Uh, Balmer is basically a new class liberal, uh, just like I am and just like about 90% of all trained historians are. Uh, just as importantly, and here the contrast with Marsden is even stronger, uh, Balmer does not posit uh, any substantive tension between academia and faith. Uh, Balmer plays the role of prophet vis-a-vis uh, -vis evangelicals, but not vis-a-vis -vis his, uh, his colleagues. Like Marsden, Balmer showed uh, that works about evangelicals could make a splash uh, well outside of the evangelical pond. Uh, his book uh, and then documentary, uh, Mont Eyes Have Seen the Glory, uh, a journey into the evangelical subculture in America, uh, which first appeared in, in 1989, uh, was influential for, for its phenomenological uh, case study approach to modern evangelicalism. Uh, whereas Marsden gave scholars essential background, uh, Balmer provided fodder for historical analysis of the headlines. Uh, thus, the more polemical side of Balmer's scholarship continues to resonate, particularly his suggestion that, his suggestions that first of all, the Christian right was uh, initially uh, a response to the racially tinged anxieties of Christian private school interests. Uh, not to social issues like abortion. And secondly, uh, his argument that the Christian right is a historical anomaly uh, compared with the great 19th century tradition of social reform. Uh, these are powerful arguments, uh, but they are also are very debatable. Uh, 
partly because of Balmer's status uh, and partly because he is not known uh, for his generosity as a book reviewer, uh, many historians have effectively countered his, his historiographical moves without really directly countering him. Uh, Balmer uh, could have shelved his evangelical backstory, a uh, Midwestern pastor's kid who interned for John Anderson and then voted for Jimmy Carter, and still have been a very successful academic. Uh, actually, when he first kind of came out as a thoughtful evangelical, he was taking a career risk. Uh, as it happened, he made a career-boosting decision uh, to the point where there is uh, no small amount of uh, irony uh, when this Ivy League professor urges evangelicals, quote, to position themselves once again at the margins of society. So Balmer's uh, academic trajectory uh, pretended the success of the next group of evangelical historians that I am considering, a group I call the Liminals. Uh, Marsden revealed, uh, George Marsden revealed that a, a bona fide uh, Christian scholar can make it, uh, but uh, Balmer is more suggestive of how many historians with evangelical backgrounds um, um, actually have made it. Uh, Again, uh, although Marsden trained a generation of historians for the Secular Academy, uh, Balmer foreshadowed how some of them would negotiate a, an academic world that was significantly more secular than a place like, like Notre Dame, uh, where Marsden uh, 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 taught for quite some time. Uh, some of uh, uh, these liminals, as I'm calling them again, uh, still are evangelicals. Uh, some might be called post-evangelicals, and some might really never have been evangelicals at all. Uh, but they are all connected in an, an influential way uh, to, hit to evangelical history itself. You know, they're part of the story. So back to my, um, uh, my autobiography. Uh, as mentioned before, I became a scholar of evangelicalism, uh, thinking that I was still a historian of the South. Uh, so I only had a vague sense of the community, of the scholarly community that, that, that I was joining. Uh, it was a gradual awakening. Uh, one such breakthrough moment came uh, here in, uh, at the Graham Center archives in 2006, although it might have been 2005. Again, my personal archives aren't so, are, are kind of shabby. Um, uh, I was at the Graham Center either wrapping up dissertation research or transitioning to the book revisions. And on, uh, I believe, the final day of my visit, I met a historian named David Swartz, uh, David Swartz, who was researching a dissertation about the evangelical left, um, progressive evangelicalism. Uh, I suspect that he was then knee-deep in the papers of Evangelicals for Social Action. Uh, we had a pleasant chat, uh, and we confirmed to our relief that we were not writing about the same topics, although, <laughs> although as is always the case, um, there, are, there were others at that very time writing about our topics, um, uh, more or less. It's just inevitable, uh, particularly in 20th century American history. Uh, then uh, David was then a Notre Dame grad student, uh, uh, he also is a Wheaton alum. Uh, and uh, he is a fellow Mennonite, uh, but from a wing of the larger church whose, uh, whose members uh, are historically overall uh, less ambivalent about the whole evangelical thing. Uh, in fact, uh, David uh, uh, was and is happy to be a part of that community, uh, both in religious and scholarly terms, uh, bringing his, uh, Anabaptist, his Anabaptist perspective to the table, uh, like Ron Sider. Um, this was uh, one of many similar introductions to Notre Dame trained Protestant historians who were adding to and rewriting the history of their mentors. Uh, many of them uh, had gone to small evangelical or church affiliated schools. Uh, looking beyond the Marsden circle, the list of historians who come from something of an evangelical background and for whom that background still serves uh, some sort of self-definitional uh, function uh, is endless uh, and also varied. Uh, some, uh, like David Swartz or, 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 or Thomas Kidd, who's, who's at Baylor, um, uh, are very much in the mold, I would argue, of the thoughtful evangelicals. Um, overall, though, the second group is more removed uh, from the evangelical scene. Uh, if you take um, Randall Stevens, uh, who co-authored uh, uh, his second book, uh, The Anointed, uh, Evangelical Truth in a Secular Age, uh, while he was still teaching at Eastern Nazarene University. Uh, Stevens and his co-author, uh, Carl Giberson, uh, damned the likes of, uh, the, of, of Ken Ham, uh, the creationist guru, uh, with evidence of intellectual thinness. Uh, but their book is really a scholarly intervention. It's not a sermon. Uh, 
Uh, so unlike uh, Mark Knoll's uh, now classic book, the, the Scandal of the Evangelical Mind, Mind which uh, covered some of the same territory 15 years earlier, the anointed uh, did not necessarily have to be written uh, by persons uh, from an evangelical perspective. In fact, it really uh, was only written that way in a kind of loose uh, sense. Uh, Randall Stevens' uh, um, 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 holiness uh, background uh, gave him leverage in choosing the topics for his two books. His earlier book was on Southern Pentecostalism, uh, but his status as an observer participant, uh, uh, jaded or otherwise, was really relatively muted. Um, Along with uh, Stevens, who, who now teaches at Northumbria University uh, in, in Britain, uh, Matthew Sutton uh, and Darren Dochuk uh, largely follow Randall Balmer's lead in being at ease in, sec in, in, in secular academia. Uh, like Balmer, they are not, uh, or, no or, or are no longer at least, invested in the idea of Christian scholarship per se. Uh, unlike Balmer, though, they are not activists. Um, Yet their shared evangelical background does seem to matter uh, in the sense, sense that it gives them a way to state and to assume credibility, credibility as scholars of evangelicalism. Uh, this can be a subtle thing, uh, but it seems to matter. Um, um, and among the liminals as a whole, uh, evangelical ties have often functioned uh, function in this way as kind of background noise, uh, in the sense that you would notice it uh, um, only if it went away. Uh, like uh, Randall Stevens, uh, Sutton was named to a list of, quote, top young historians uh, that was compiled by the History and News uh, Network website um, a few years ago. Uh, also, uh, like Stevens, uh, Sutton explained his initial uh, choice of research topic, um, um, a book on, on Amy Semple McPherson, uh, in, in autobiographical terms, uh, as Sutton uh, told the History and News Network, uh, quote, I grew up in Southern California's evangelical subculture and it had a lot of family connections to uh, the International Church of the Four Square Gospel, which, which, which um, Semple McPherson founded. Uh, when I started applying to graduate schools, I realized that McPherson was uh, a perfect vehicle through which to explore gender, mass media, popular culture, and politics in the interwar years. So this is neither a statement of faith uh, nor a statement of loss of faith. It's a statement of legitimacy, uh, uh, of authenticity. Uh, in the case of Darren Dochuk, who is um, um, a product, uh, uh, and most recently, the, uh, a, a returnee to the uh, Notre Dame that, that Hatch and Morrison created, uh, this credibility has enabled him to maintain ties to the, uh, the uh, faith and history scene uh, that really is no longer part of his everyday identity, uh, but he's still a kind of favorite son of sorts. There is a serious uh, difference in sensibility here, I think, between the liminals and the thoughtful evangelicals. Uh, and it was really only in drafting this lecture or thinking about it, conceptualizing it, that it occurred to me that to, to the extent uh, I belong anywhere at all, as uh, someone who has, you know, a foot and maybe a few extra toes out of the academy, um, I am one of the liminals. Uh, so let me offer a more personalized example of what distinguishes, in my mind, the liminals from the thoughtful evangelical generation. I'm going to do so by comparing myself as a student of Billy Graham uh, with Grant Wacker, an another scholar of Graham whose recent uh, interpretive, bi interpretive biography of the evangelist has been justly uh, celebrated. Uh, note that I'm not actually comparing my first book to Grant's opus, uh, rather I'm comparing uh, how we have positioned ourselves in relation to Graham. So in my first book, uh, I refer to my religious background uh, for one primary purpose and that is to establish why I thought the term evangelical was useful, uh, because it correlated with my experience. Uh, most members of my home church, uh, Stuart Straft Mennonite Church, uh, basically were evangelical Christians who happened to have some kind of ancestral or sociological tie to Mennonites, or who in some cases just a tie to that one congregation, th that one church. Uh, in my introduction, um, I noted that while my home church uh, did not actually interact very much with the Baptist church down, down the road, uh, the uh, two basically were on the same team. Uh, and the revival service at Sir Staff Mennonite that drew me forward, forward at age 10 could just as well have occurred at Stuart Straff Baptist. Um, now, I probably could have found a blogger or some, a, a, a famous scholar who said something similar and quoted them or cited them, 
But in my mind, including that, that brief autobiographical flourish at the encouragement of my editor, uh, was my way of asking secular readers and uh, supporters of Billy Graham alike uh, to trust me or to at least kind of lay off. Um, compare this to uh, Grant Wacker's note, to what Grant Wacker wrote uh, in the preface to his magisterial uh, biography of Graham. Uh, his approach might be called Marsden Light. Uh, Wacker describes his faith by way of explaining his point of view, uh, same language that Marsden used, about Graham, uh, uh, rather, than, rather than as a way of explaining why he chose his subject. So uh, Wacker writes, or wrote, um, I count myself as a partisan of the same evangelical um, tradition that Graham represented, uh, especially the Irenic, inclusive, pragmatic form that Graham came to symbolize in the later years of his public ministry. Uh, that identification comes from my upbringing and my adult choice. So uh, in my book, I, I left out the adult choice uh, part, partly because at that point at least my status was a bit up in the air, uh, but mainly because it wasn't my point. Uh, I was talking about where I came from rather than who I was, uh, even though there is a, a lot of alignment between those two things. Uh, I was telling our readers to expect some empathy in part because I felt like I knew Billy Graham's world in a way that um, uh, would, uh, would, um, um, could supplement the archival research that I did here. Um, uh, Wacker, on the other hand, uh, feels a certain loyalty in, in, in stated so up front. Uh, while softer than Marsden's style, what he wrote still reads like a testimony, a statement that he is an evangelical and a scholar. So he is telling readers that he is going to write with some sympathy because he is part of Billy Graham's world. The often, the, the often quite sublimated role of evangelical identity in, in many works by the liminals raises the question of just how much their background really matters. In short, does it doesn't matter whether or not you went to Petra concerts, you know, back in the day. Uh, um, uh, or Michael W. Smith or whatever. I guess Michael W. Smith is still around. Uh, um, I think it does, actually. Uh, uh, if those experiences are what led you toward your subject matter. Um, I've been using the term liminal because so many of the folks mentioned above straddle the line between being uh, scholars of evangelicalism on the one hand and evangelical scholars on the other hand. Uh, the the uh, difference, uh, I, as I see it, has less to do with one's personal faith identity and more to do with how, again, how invested one is in the idea of Christian scholarship. Uh, uh, for many liminals, to use an example, uh, if you take someone like David Barton, uh, David Barton, the uh, God and Country pseudo-historian, um, uh, for, for uh, many of the liminals I've been writing about, someone like Barton uh, is not just a subject to write about, not just another you know, performer in the Christian right carnival. Um, he's also a competition, uh, or, or at least someone to react against. Uh, so Barton might represent what has been left behind um, but he's still, part, he's still part of the story, um, part, of, part of their story. Turning now to my final group, the uh, trend liners. Um, recently, uh, Mark Knoll uh, characterized uh, the current situation for evangelical historians as, quote, relatively good. Uh, but by this he meant only relatively good, um, at least in, in my reading. Uh, his cautionary tone, I, I think, was justified but also conceals the fact that, in my mind at least, historians of evangelicalism are more prominent than ever. Uh, but fewer of them are evangelicals by, by any, de any definition of the word. Um, uh, part of the uh, neo-evangelical project that, that I mentioned earlier was the goal of, of reasserting the, in the intellectual status of evangelicalism uh, beyond the realm of um, uh, Bible schools. Um, in a strange way, uh, that goal has been, has been achieved in the historical profession, but with a critical twist. Uh, so it's not evangelicalism as a preferred brand of Christianity, but rather evangelicalism as a preferred subject matter uh, that has arrived. Now first, uh, caught wind of this development uh, about a decade ago, uh, when I started shopping my dissertation around to various publishers. Um, I eventually went with um, University of Pennsylvania Press, uh, and that was due in no small part to the interest of uh, one of the series editors, uh, the historian Michael Kazin. Uh, Kazin is a, a leading political, histor 
a, a leading political historian uh, and also one of the best known scholars on the American left. Um, Kazin was in the midst at that point, uh, point of completing his fantastic uh, biography of uh, Warren Jennings Bryan. Um, Jennings Bryan, the uh, thrice failed Democratic presidential nominee, uh, who no doubt would be, could be remembered as a founding father of American liberalism uh, were it not for his grand finale as a founding pundit of, of American fundamentalism um, at the Scopes trial. Uh, Kazin uh, already had an, an existing interest in American popul populism, but he had become increasingly aware of progressive America's problem, problem um, uh, with religion. Uh, and, and really, I should, I should clarify that what he was talking about was white progressive America's religion problem. Uh, and his concern, uh, that is how lack of empathy toward religion was hurting the American left, um, uh, contributed to his interest in Brian's status as a Christian populist. Uh, so not unlike uh, many progressive evangelical historians, uh, Kazin was interested in a an evangelical politi political genealogy that did not lead directly to the Christian right. Uh, but again, it was the presence of the Christian right, especially during the Bush years, uh, as a subset of the larger rise of conservatism that made evangelicalism a research commodity among scholars uh, who had no personal ties to the evangelical uh, world. So, uh, in looking at this final group, uh, the trend setters, or trend liners, excuse me, um, as I'm calling them, uh, I'm going to uh, uh, focus largely on three works that reveal the relative it quality of evangelicalism. Uh, the first is uh, Bethany Morton's book, uh, To Serve God in Walmart, uh, The Making of Christian Free Enterprise, which came out in two 2009. The second one is Molly Worthen's uh, book, Apostles of Reason, The Crisis of Authority in American Evangelicalism, which appeared uh, last year, or at the end of 2013. Um, and Kevin Cruz's recently published One Nation Under God, How Corporate America Invented Christian America, which came out um, earlier this year. To be clear, while I am distinguishing these authors from the liminals, uh, I really have not interrogated their backgrounds to any great degree. So I'm going on what they have written, uh, that it, or how I interp have interpreted what they have written, and how to the best of my knowledge uh, they are received within the larger academy. So Bethany Morton uh, was trying to avoid uh, the glib rhetorical question, uh, what's the matter with Kansas? Uh, that progressive author Thomas Frank echoed uh, in a book about um, his home state in 2004, that for a while was all the rage on the left. Um, uh, but Morton, too, like uh, Frank, wanted to explain in part why so many everyday evangelicals have embraced a politics uh, that in conventional terms is called conservative, but that on an even larger scale bolsters what critics call the neoliberal economic order. Uh, put, away, uh, put another way, as Morton, who was also a top historian, according to the uh, History News Network, uh, said, uh, the, her book is, is about, quote, the unlikely legitimation of neoliberal economics through evangelical religion. Uh, so Walmart, uh, for her, functioned as a way station between these two categories, uh, revealing them to be strikingly of a piece. Um, uh, if you read through this book, Morton made little effort to downplay her left-leaning line of inquiry. It's right there in her, in her, her closing sentence, or, or one of her closing sentences. We, you know, note the choice of pronoun, uh, we will need to learn from Christian free enterprise that there was no bright line dividing hard issues from soft, economic concerns from cultural distractions, the bread from the roses. Um, yet her book, To Serve God in Walmart, is not a Michael Moore style screed, of, um, not even close. Uh, the wide lens of her study focuses on how Christian free, free enterprise was embedded in both a corporation and a region, Walmart and Walmart country, as she puts it. Uh, but her more memorable uh, narrow lens uh, zeroes in on the women of Walmart. Uh, especially the clerks who invariably worked under male managers. Um, one of Morton's major points is that Walmart women did not have a uh, false consciousness, uh, to use that, that popular uh, Marxist-Leninist term. Um, so th in other words, they were not self-contradicting self dupes. Um, uh, 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 they were not that, as, as Morton argued in her incredibly ambitious uh, book. And I think her book shows the, the exciting things that can happen when evangelical history moves outside of an exclusively evangelical context. In that respect, uh, Molly Worthen's book, Apostles of Reason, is a more focused and a more traditional history of evangelicalism. Uh, her choice of topic 
um, uh, is the, inter the, the intellectual life or lives, uh, uh, excuse me, the, the, uh, the evangelical life or lives of the mind uh, since mid-century. Uh, her book is thoroughly in the uh, Mark Knoll and George Marsden mode, um, and that is probably one reason why she has become a kind of honorary thoughtful evangelical. Uh, Apostles of Reason is notable for its efforts to broaden the evangelical, the evangelical intellectual canopy a bit, so moving beyond the usual um, more reformed uh, subjects, uh, even though it should be clear to anyone reading the book that those folks had outsized influence. Uh, and more importantly, I think uh, she makes the move of treating theology as intellectual history by effectively equating the history of evangelical doctrinal debates and policy spats with the history of post-war thought in general. Uh, to be sure, uh, Worthen treats evangelical infighting as important in its own right. Uh, so as such, as such uh, her book uh, might be the best scholarly evidence we have that evangelicalism is now seen as an important topic. You know, no external verification needed. Uh, this is true even though Worthen's book is more about evangelical anxiety than it is about evangelical power. Uh, as she writes, is evangelicals' ongoing crisis of authority, uh, their struggle to reconcile reason with revelation, heart with mind, and private piety with, public, with the public square that best explains their anxiety and their animosity toward intellectual life. Um, so in, uh, in Worthen's analysis, those tensions assume a kind of definitional quality for American evangelicals. So Apostles of Reason uh, thus is a story of, of the uh, divided minds of those who presupposed an undivided faith. Uh, to my mind, the uh, major limit of this study uh, is that it does not explain evangelical power, uh, including the possibility that evangelicals' uh, anxiety at some point is a byproduct of not acknowledging their influence. Um, it, is, it is a tricky move on Worthen's part to frame uh, the importance of a subject in terms of its overall lack of coherence. Uh, but again, the fact that she did so and, and produced a, 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 a highly touted book uh, suggests to me that evangelical influence is not, um, or that, that, that evangelical influence is assumed on the part of many, um, um, many educated readers. Uh, in short, this is the kind of rich and nuanced book uh, that can gain currency only when there are a lot of people out there who, who genuinely want to know something about American evangelicals. That word, um, uh, nuance, uh, is not a word I would use to describe uh, Kevin Cruz's book, One, Nations Un One Nation Under God. Uh, it does uh, have stellar production qualities. Uh, it is well written, deeply researched, and filled with, with wonderful case studies, which some of which I might use in classes down the road. Um, uh, uh, Cruz's argument is right there in the subtitle, How Corporate America Invented Christian America. Uh, more specifically, as he seeks to show Modern Christian America talk uh, is, the byproduct, is the product of corporate resistance to the New Deal, uh, not of, say, uh, Cold War consensus-style faith uh, or 1970s evangelical activism. Uh, Cruz does not mean to suggest that all subsequent God and country politics uh, has merely been cover for business interests. Indeed, he rightly notes that his subject matter took on a life of its own. But he does want to stress uh, its historical intimacy with corporate conservatism. This is a combination that he calls Christian libertarianism. Uh, somewhat like Bethany Morton, who wrote about Christian free enterprise, uh, uh, Cruz also wants to step outside of the historiography of, of evangelicalism, or perhaps he never really wanted to step in it. Uh, this is, and this is where I think Cruz runs into some trouble. Uh, while Morton had a uh, larger story to hang her hat on, that story being Walmart and the neoliberal economy, uh, Cruz's book is inescapably a prehistory of the Reagan era Christian right. Uh, take away 1980 and the Reagan revolution, and his topic, his topic would have a lot less cachet. Uh, the problem is that he implicitly undersells the, the impact of the modern Christian right. Uh, another more obvious problem is that the myth, the uh, myth of Christian nationhood was not so much created as it was present at the creation. So it's not a new thing. Uh, it, it is important, I think, not to lose track of just how obscure uh, many uh, proto-Christian right figures really were. Uh, the actors in Cruz's story uh, who were not obscure, uh, such as Billy Graham, uh, might have been conservatives, um, 
but they did not actually succeed much uh, in pulling the nation rightward, at least in the, in, in the, uh, the immediate post-war years. Uh, the uh, Christian right uh, seemed new in 1980, in large part because the uh, well-heeled but usually hapless efforts, uh, because of the well-heeled but usually hapless efforts that came before it. In some ways, uh, Cruz's book is a cautionary tale about talent, status, and book advances. Uh, uh, but at the same time, uh, the uh, trendsetter generation, the trendliner generation overall of historians uh, promises to move the study of evangelicalism in valuable directions, in, in very valuable directions. Uh, one book I, I would highlight here, uh, which I'm not going to go into um, uh, uh, much more, is uh, um, Michael J. McVicker's uh, recently published biography of, of R.J. Rushdoony and the broader uh, Christian Reconstructionism uh, scene, uh, which is fantastic. Uh, and there's plenty of evidence that evangelicalism remains something of a privileged subject in American public life. Uh, one example here would be the anthropologist uh, T.M. Lerman, uh, who wrote a book called When God Talks Back, Understanding the American Evangelical Relationship with God. Uh, like uh, uh, Molly Worthen, uh, Lerman is a regular in the New York Times Week in Review uh, section. So now, um, Turning to my conclusion, uh, clearly the uh, historiography of American evangelicalism is entering a new phase. Um, I'm not alone in, in making such a suggestion. Uh, historian uh, Nathan Finn uh, foresees, quote, a golden age uh, for historians of evangelicalism. Uh, Mark Knoll uh, counters that a decline in religiously charged issues, uh, uh, that is Christian right style issues, uh, actually would might lower the demand for historians of evangelicalism. Now, there, recently, there have been plenty of those issues. Uh, Noel is right uh, that context matters. Uh, the context has changed a lot since the 80s, the 90s, or even the aughts. Uh, and, and I want to focus my brief uh, concluding thoughts on the significance of those changes for how American evangelicalism is and will be studied by historians. Um, and here's the rub. Uh, in some ways, the, schol the scholarly salience of evangelicalism is peaking just as the cultural salience of evangelicalism appears to be waning. Uh, the the uh, lag time between headlines and scholarship uh, is not surprising. Uh, it's basically the, the opportunity cost of footnoting. Uh, but um, as, Andrew as Andrew Hartman, a, a, a historian recently uh, has suggested, um, or he's recently argued that, quote, the, the logic of the culture wars has been exhausted. Uh, uh, to be sure, I can think of a number of social issues that, that, that are not going away anytime soon, uh, uh, abortion being the obvious one. But clearly, uh, the culture wars metaphor is a bit tired, uh, and so perhaps the same might be said, soon be said of studies of this thing called evangelicalism. Uh, maybe, but probably not, I would suggest. Um, for one, as long as Christian colleges are still around, and I think they will be, will be around at least for a while, uh, um, Evangelicalism will most certainly be studied uh, from a church history angle. Uh, scholars in this realm will continue to debate the merits of the term evangelical, but then proceed to use it because there really is no better shorthand for describing the many, the many things that link conservative Protestants in American society. Within the secular academy, uh, the future is less certain. Uh, still, though, I, would th I think that uh, evangelical historiography might already be more institutionally entrenched than we realize. Uh, quite a few of the liminals uh, uh, in the trend liners uh, mentioned above uh, have uh, graduate students. Uh, and this realm is where the secularization of evangelical history will continue to be most evident. Um, as mainstream evangelical studies moves farther away from anything resembling an evangelical movement, evangelicalism might become just another subject, uh, blessedly free of baggage and scandal but perhaps also less interesting, less meaningful. On the other hand, there is a chance, just a chance, that scholarship on evangelicalism will become livelier and more, and more contentious as it becomes a, a little less clubby. Um, but all in all, at least for the foreseeable future, I don't think there's cause to worry about the, the end of evangelical history uh, or evangelical historiography, uh, barring, of course, the end of history itself. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we uh, can have some questions now if there's uh, some from the audience. Uh.
after the question and answer period, uh, we have in the back uh, an exhibit of some of the documents from the archives, as an example of some of the things we have, and also uh, some uh, food and drink there for those who need nourishment. So, uh, Steve, uh, if you can ask some questions, but I can just ask a question. Sure. Start with, um, have you thought about, or do you see a pattern uh, with other topics in American religious history, such as Puritanism or Pentecostalism, that parallels or contradicts kind of what you see in the study of evangelicalism? The, uh, Perhaps because it relates to other areas of interest, um, I see a similar a similarity in a different field, the history of the American South. Um, uh, which, uh, so if um, uh, in the um, 60, 50s, 60s, and 70s, that was kind of the it period for the history of the American South, you know, for, for obvious reasons, in part, you know, with the uh, civil rights um, um, revolution and the, the, the centennial of the uh, Civil War, and so many of the pioneering scholars there uh, were kind of thoughtful Southern historians who, who kind of acted as, as voices of a, of, um, of, a, of a reason in a contested region. Um, but then, um, you know, since then, uh, the historiography of the American South has become much more um, kind of de-linked from that story. I mean, I think there were still people who come into it uh, kind of inspired by that noble history of, uh, of um, of activist historians, but uh, you know it's 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 it's, it's much broader. So, I mean, I, I think at some level it's probably just an it's a larger narrative of professionalization. You know, something something expands and becomes linked with uh, with uh, research universities, things like that. Steve, thanks a lot. This was um, uh, you know very satisfying on, on many levels. So I just want to say thank you for that. I, I really enjoyed that. Um, there's there's kind of a, a comment and then a question. First of all, so I um, I did my doctorate as you know, David Bevington. And uh, and so one of the things when I was finishing up my master's um, to kind of corroborate some some of your thoughts here is that uh, my uh, master's supervisor sort of gave me a, a little warning about whether or not I should really study the Bevington, kind of based on his you know, his writing wasn't in that confessional way, right? That there was a sense of, he didn't really put in his books, hey, this is who I am, this is sort of my, right, in, in that same way, and so I just sort of offered that. I mean, I hadn't thought about it in that way, um, but I think that's exactly what uh, my master's supervisor was sort of suggesting. I, I, think, uh, I think widely ignored that and went on. And it was funny, as I was around Britain working with a number of different scholars on projects, that there was that people sort of want to know that were that were kind of you know in that kind of very evangelical world. Like, is they sort of asking, is he really evangelical? Is he really? So there was always that sense of if you're not kind of putting that in your preface or your acknowledgments in some way, like you know looking for that, especially among that first kind of um, kind of founding generation. So I thought that was interesting when you put that. And I appreciated that. Um, and then secondly, I was kind of wondered, um, when you talk about um, the rise of kind of this first generation as well, um, with the uh, kind of their rise to prominence in the research is that you had a lot of these um, political events, right? There's a lot of stuff there going on that kind of coincided and led, it kind of helped um, externally led to their importance. Um, and I was one of our I wonder what you think about the fact that, um, uh, you know, Noel talked about that scandal of the evangelical mind, that, that there weren't a lot of evangelicals doing research on these areas, right? Um, and so that, what do you think about the fact that there wasn't, um, that they basically had a lot of this untouched material to cover? So that, like, for instance, when I came, kind of came into the evangelical world, I started, doing, hey, this would make a great paper, or, this would make a great kind of chapter in the book if people ask me to write on something, I'd say, okay, great, I'd go do, look, and I'd say, oh my gosh, Mark has already written on this, yeah. or Mark has already written on this, or gosh, Mark, they've already touched on this stuff, right? But it was earlier stuff, and it was exactly. like, you know, that it was there, that, so nobody was kind of doing it, but they, um, you know, nobody touched it, but they started touching it, you know, so that kind of 
helps maybe rise. So as we, as later generations start getting into that, we're citing and looking at a lot of that stuff as well. Um, so just sort of wonder what you thought about that at all, um, and looking at the rise of their, of their sort of, the prominence. Yeah, with the uh, Bebbington thing, um, just thinking out loud, as inevitably one does in this context, um, uh, I kind of wonder if there's also a difference there in, in American academic culture versus British or, or Anglo culture um, uh, in terms of the, the, the need to confess, confess how you're confessing. Maybe you think you're confessing, but you're really not, you know, because <laughs> uh, if you're more reticent. Um, uh, um, with uh, the other argument point you were making, yeah, I guess there, there, there could be a kind of supply side theory there. There was just a lot of there were a lot of interesting things um, uh, to uh, to write about. Although I think um, then that second generation, the liminals, you know, uh, there was probably some overlap in subject matter, but I think they were writing it just you know they were a degree removed, you know, from from. Uh, um, um, maybe some of the politics of writing about evangelical history, if that makes sense. Maybe continuing on, on Andy's point, and maybe I feel as an evangelical scholar myself the need to wriggle out of this beautifully framed thesis that I think really helps some cartography of what's going on. And I want to hear your response. Maybe one way is that, well, we got this stuff early and often, right? I mean, freshman here 20 years ago, I was videos of Balmer on the, on the okay. Blanchard lawn pointing and, and, and Ockholm said to us, what do you think of this? And so we started to think about it early and there was a sense in which, well, so many people have worked on this, let's study something else. I'm thinking of um, Tim Larson running off to point out the religious backdrop of anthropology or someone going into a completely different field. So I just wondered if that's even a fair retort, not that I'm trying to report, but just to play it back with you. And what would you make of somebody like Greg Thornberry, right? He's certainly a thoughtful evangelical who's doing intellectual history like Molly Worthen of Carl Henry. Well, would that not qualify as university press serious historical work? Uh, it might. I, actually, I, I, I don't claim to have. Uh, there, there are definitely some works that, that I you know, um, uh, need to be more familiar with. Um, in terms of, uh, yeah, the. Uh, Early, I guess your, your first comment, it makes me wonder if, yeah, I, I think probably one thing that was going on with, with uh, uh, persons like um, uh, Bethany Morton, uh, probably Molly Worth, and definitely Kevin Cruz, is that, yeah, when you come at it from the outside, you don't necessarily really care as much about, about who's been about it before. So there's a certain naivete, probably. I mean, from an insider's perspective, it could be seen as a certain arrogance too, like where that you can come in and and, and, uh, and write about this uh, 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 material. But I think that's also, you know, um, kind of you know, just uh, an unavoidable uh, dynamic there. So yeah, I guess if you're raised in it, maybe if you're raised in that context, uh, it might seem less exciting to write about. Is that part of what you're saying? I, I just wonder. I mean. And of course, if someone goes off and writes about something else, they're no longer qualified as a historian. But I'm just wondering if the history of evangelical thought has morphed so quickly that, if, that um, there might be other ways of looking at it instead of just who currently dominates the field. Just to complement oh. what you said, which is really illuminating and interesting. I'm just wondering, are there, are there ones who have escaped and gone in other directions that are shining an evangelical light on a field that is a little bit nervous? Oh, no, what's this person doing here? Yeah, no, um, uh, I mean, th to be candid, my, my work here is, is, is more focused on, on, on historiography. So yeah, it would be interesting to see yeah, anthropology, sociology, philosophy definitely as well to see, to see if, if, there, if similar dynamics are, are being replicated.
Uh, what book did you read? Do you remember? I don't remember. Cause I could, okay. Okay. It was my first Yeah, no, got gotcha. you. Yeah, I'm sorry, yeah. Um, I guess it depends what, what you mean by, um, or how that, how that sympathy uh, um, uh, is expressed. But yeah, actually, I mean, it's already been done, I think, uh, um, uh, uh, since I've been candid. And I'll, in my talk, I'll continue being candid. Um, uh, Daniel Williams' book, uh, uh, God's Own Party, History of the, basically History of the Christian Right. I mean, um, uh, you know, it's, um, I, I think he views himself as being not necessarily sy sympathetic to the Christian right, but sympathetic to um, um, uh, uh, some of the broader concerns uh, 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 that were at work, at work there, and I think that's been received um, well. That said, uh, I'm sure Dan has gotten, you know, I'm sure people try to size him up all the time. And I, I think I, that's, um, any time that you're slightly right to the left-facing left center of academia, I think you're just gonna, you're gonna have people, you know, uh, 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 try to, uh, to uh, label you. But it's unavoidable. I label people in this talk, too, so there you go. <laughs> I think perhaps you just use the word fundamentalism from the name of George Marcy's Fundamentalism in American Literature. And these, these three groups of historians you know, the first group would have a great deal of distinction and nuance between evangelicalism emerging out of fundamentalism. And then you get to the religious right and Jerry Falwell, the moral majority, and so they had, he had the fundamentalism journey. They were very distinct yeah. from evangelicalism. And they were and somewhere along the way, because of perhaps also some of Islamic fundamentalism, the way that the media treats that as a fundamentalism project. Yeah. Uh, we both rejected the fundamentalism title and sort of merged with evangelicalism. I'm wondering if in this in the other two groups of scholars, is, is there awareness of that distinction in the nuance, or is it kind of lost, more than lost in the stuff? Um. Uh, the works I know best and the historians whom I know best, what I would say is there is an awareness of, this, of the distinction and then in some cases a strategic decision to uh, either ignore that distinction or, or downplay it um, uh, because, precisely because those labels have been used for, for um, strategic reasons, you know, to, to distance oneself from another, from someone, else, someone whom one otherwise might have, have quite a bit. Uh, uh, in common with, and in my, in the case of, of my second book, uh, the second half of it, uh, I, I, um, I, n I argue that, that uh, politically at least, the distinction between the evangelical and fundamentalist did, did kind of uh, wane um, uh, for, 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 re for reasons that you um, uh, 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 suggested, you know, that, so that by, um, um, you know, by uh, uh, the George W. Bush uh, uh, era, I mean, you know, Charles Colson was saying things that sounded not unlike Jerry Falwell, you know, circa 1980. Um, uh, so, but I think, that, I think that's, that's a, that's a, I'm glad you asked that question because I, because I think it's kind of telling of, um, if, if you are invested in um, uh, being part of the evangelical story uh, in some of those definitional and boundary keeping issues, then you probably would pay more attention to those labels. If, if, you're, um, uh, uh, if you're looking at it from a, an outside perspective, then you will note right away uh, just, you know, uh, uh, the uh, significant overlap between people who are being called fundamentalists and people who are being called evangelical. Yeah, I, I take, um, uh, in my second book, uh, an incredibly, um, in, you know, uh, um, uh, broad, um, use, use an incredibly broad um, approach to evangelicalism, basically as the, the uh, public expression of born-again Christianity. Um, although even that would, probably wouldn't satisfy 
uh, are persons who could be labeled evangelical. So yeah, yeah, persons who label themselves as evangelical or who were authoritatively labeled. So um, uh, uh, in, in my second book, it, it, it includes um, um, you know, groups, uh, or I, I view something like Habitat for Humanity, for example, as an evangelical phenomenon, even though obviously it was much bro broader um, than that. But uh, my approach as a um, historian of religion and a political historian has been to kind of uh, uh, sidestep some of the uh, 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 doctrinal and theological um, dynamics, but simply to try to explain why I, why I was view why I'm including someone in the narrative rather than having rather than starting from a definition of evangelicalism and then excluding or, or including particular people. So, but I realize there are you know. Uh, th there are much more thorough definitions of evangelical than, than what I've uh, applied. But I do think that, that, that I mean, the, uh, uh, the wider net, I think, allows us to, to um, get a broader sense of, uh, of um, the, the, the way in which evangelicalism as a phenomenon, not just evangelicals, but as a phenomenon, uh, was influencing um, uh, 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 American history so that groups uh, like the American Civil Liberties Union and people for the American way who define themselves against the Christian right can, can, can be part of the story too.